Hey y'all, this is Shane Messer. Welcome back to Daily Music Theory. This is Tambra Part 2. So if you remember, um, Tambra is the unique sound of an instrument person's voice. And if you remember me talking about string instruments, I mentioned that the human voice um, can be divided into categories. And those categories are soprano, alto, tenor, bass when it comes to vocal parts and music. So the soprano is obviously the highest, alto second, um, tenor third, and then bass is the lowest. Um, generally, soprano and alto are sung by females, um, tenor and bass are sung by males. Um, these parts don't always necessarily correspond to vocal type. Vocal type's a little bit different. It also um, depends on certain qualities such as the actual timbre of the voice, um, with how bright and dark it is, that is, um, the weight of the voice, things like that, not just range. But when we're talking about vocal parts, um, the most common are soprano, alto, and tenor bass. And Basically, I would demonstrate this, but we haven't talked about pitch yet, so I'm going to probably talk about voice topping a little bit later on, just as a funsy video. Um, so we might do that after we've talked about pitch a little bit. But um, just to give you an idea, um, most bass parts would range from about here at the lowest up to about somewhere right through there. Uh, most tenor parts, um, tenor and alto parts of music are generally kind of confined to a limited range. So I would say for like the average tenor part, probably no more than maybe about the highest. Um, an alto part, probably about and then soprano part would um, actually not too high in music. It's generally just sings a melody. If you look at a hymn or a Bach chorale, you're not going to find a soprano part that's too high the fifth octave, but probably somewhere about at the extreme, probably. Um, now, of course, there's exceptions. Um, bass, the bass force usually has the broadest range, and we'll kind of get into the why that's so a little bit later on. But um, those are the four um, vocal parts in a nutshell, basically. And, of course, the instruments like woodwinds, brass wind, well, strings, all the other families, they have um, subcategories that are kind of based off of these. So if we take the clownet family, um, the clownet that I play is the soprano clownet, but there's also a clownet that's um, about the size of an alto sax, maybe a little bit bigger, and it's the alto clownet. And then you have, of course, the bass clownet, which is rather large. If I was playing and holding it right here, and it was in my mouth, the um, bell of it would touch the floor probably. By the bell, I mean the end of the instrument. Um, so, and in the string family, of course, like I said, violin, viola, cello, double bass, it kind of mirrors the soprano, alto, and tenor bass as far as ranges go. Um, another um, element that's important when talking about timbre is, like I said, brightness and darkness, and that's when we get into like vocal types. You'll see that a little bit if we touch on that. But um, something I didn't mention yesterday in the other video, um, brass instruments, they're um, either bright or dark based on the shape of the bore. So make sure I don't misspeak here. I actually made a little note of this so I don't like to say it backwards. Um, cylindrical bore instruments usually have a brighter tone and conical bore instruments usually have a more mellow tone. So um, that's why um, flugelhorn is a little bit more mellow than a trumpet or um, let's see, so like a conical instrument is going to be a little bit brighter. Sorry, I had to end on my keyboard. Um, also, um, when we're talking about timbre, quality is important too. So like if I have a clarinet that's like really cheap, it's not going to sound as good as a clarinet that's professional like my, the model that I have. Um, so quality is very important too when determining timbre, it can sound different. Like obviously this is a clarinet sound that I have on my keyboard, right? But I mean you recognize that as a clarinet, but it's not a good clarinet sound, right? So a good client sounds going to have more depth to it, more volume, uh, it's going to be richer. Especially a client, professional client model in the hands of a professional. And that leads to a very interesting question, can you own a timbre? And the answer to that is really complex, because even if we take an instrument like the piano, right? That's a piano, but this is also a piano. <laughs> There's a billion different variations of each instrument's timbre, so 
where you draw the line at, it's a really slippery slope. It's kind of hard to decide. Um, there's been a few lawsuits based on this, apparently. Uh, um, if you want to check out an interesting video, I recommend checking out Treb Tones. Do You Own the Sound of Your Instrument? A Response to Adam Neely. It's a very good video. It um, explores that topic in more depth. Um, so it's very interesting. It's um, kind of hard to answer definitively, I guess. Um, one other thing I will mention about timbre is why it's important to us as composers in music, in, or people studying music theory, not just musicologists, but when you're interested in studying music for composing or arranging. Uh, timbre is important in that too because you want to be able to dictate like the exact sound that you want. So if I want something, if I write something that's really light and dainty, I might not want to put that on a heavier instrument. Like um, if I'm writing for band, let's say the sax, I might want to put that in the flutes or the upper clarinet voices. You don't want to put that in a lower voice because it's going to be more heavy. So that's why timbre is important because you can get the exact sound that you want most of the time. Maybe not the exact sound, but basically like more ideal than not and so that basically wraps up our talk on timbre i hope you enjoyed this video and if you did make sure to like and subscribe love you guys peace